He asked to marry her and become engaged to her. Then she said to him, what dowry do you suggest for me? So he said to her, whatever you want. And so she said, my dowry that I request of you is 3,000 dirhams, a young serving boy, a servant, and the murder of Ali ibn Abi Talib. صلى الله على سيد الخلق أجمعين أبي القاسم محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد respected Muslim brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته the assassination and the martyrdom of Amir al-Mu'minin Ali ibn Abi Talib عليه السلام is without a doubt one of the most well-known, infamous, and tragic events in all of Islamic history. When we discuss this event, it's an event that we commemorate every year during the sacred month of Ramadan it is an event that, that touches the hearts and souls of many, many people. And it is indeed for some people like me, this event is perhaps more painful than the 10th of Muharram. It is, it is an event that to this day, you look at it and you, with the benefit of hindsight, when you see what happened to the Muslim Ummah after the martyrdom of Ali, when you see what happened to his Shia, when you see what happened to his family, to his allies, to his students, when you see what happens to the Islamic State under Bani Umayyah and the horrible kingdom that it, that it was transformed into, you really feel a sense of loss. You feel a sense of almost a, fa a, a, a child has lost his father or a student has lost a very near and dear teacher. You know, on the, on the night that Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam breathed his last breath and passed on into the, into the grace and mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal, you know, that was a night that, that Orphans, widows, the weak, and the, the, the people who felt that they had no one protecting them except Ali ibn Abi Talib, that is the, the day they lost Amir al Mu'minin. When we discuss, for example, the Maghazi of Abu al Hassan, his, his battles and his amazing deeds when he fought against the Kuffar, against the Bugat, we see that following his death, the Kuffar and the Bugat, they felt a sense of relief, a sense of happiness that Ali was gone. They were free to do as they pleased. When you look at the fiqh of Amir al-Mu'mineen, you see the way he breaks things down so easily and so eloquently and with firm and complete understand, understanding of the ahkam. And you realize after his death, what ends up happening to Islamic law. You see anyone from anywhere can come and say he's a faqih and found his own madhab. In any case, it is, it is a tragedy that can perhaps only be compared to the other tragedies of the Ahlul Bayt. Because as we know, all five of the Ashab al Kisa, alayhim salam, all of them died of an unnatural death. They were all martyred in some way, shape, or form. And so Imam Ali's assassination is very interesting because many people look at it from an emotional lens and they forget to look at it from the factual lens to break down the facts, to discuss how this could have happened, how Amir al Mu'minin was assassinated, who was behind it, who had something to gain from it. Um, what we're going to be doing tonight is we're going to uh, ev be evaluating the historical sources regarding the martyrdom of Amir al-Mu'mineen, salam alayhi. In order to do this, we're going to go over a few different subjects. Firstly, we're going to go over some of the reports that indicate that Amir al-Mu'mineen, alayhi salam, knew when he was going to be martyred. We're also going to take a look at who was Ibn Muljim and how exactly he planned to assassinate Amir al-Mu'mineen, alayhi salam, how they carried how he carried out this plan and who was there to aid him who was there to help him and to support him in this this wicked endeavor and lastly we're just going to to look at ali in his final moments in those final moments with his companions and those final moments with his with his family and then of course we've are we have a lecture regarding the his burial and the place where he is buried today in al-najaf al-ashraf so with that being said let us go ahead and dive in it is recorded by al-hakim in nishapuri he narrates this report and the meaning of this report is very well corroborated he says that the Prophet وسلم, said to Ali, and this is narrated by Ali himself, he said, The Ummah shall betray you after me, and you shall live upon my religion and die upon my sunnah, and this shall be dyed with this, meaning the, your beard will be dyed with blood from your head. This report indicates that Amir al-Mu'minin, he knew when he was going to be martyred, he knew how he was going to be martyred, and this is one of the alamat nubuwa. This is one of the one of the great proofs of Rasulullah's Nabuwa. It is an example of him speaking of something of the unseen. Al-Hakim narrates another narration from Zayd ibn Wahab, who says, a delegation from the people of Basra came to Ali alayhi salam. 
And from among them, there was a man known as Ja'd ibn Najah. He praised and glorified Allah and sent blessings upon the Prophet ﷺ. Then he said, fear Allah, O Ali, for you are going to die. And this is something we see many times when we see Imam Ali's interactions with the Khawarij and some of the people of Ahlul Iraq is there was this arrogance, the sense of holier than thou, and they would advise Ali as though they knew the religion better than him. And so Ali replied, he said, no, I am, I am not going to die, but rather I will be killed. A strike on this, and he pointed at his head, will stain it with blood. And he pointed to his head and beard with his hand and said, a decreed fate, a promised covenant, and those who fabricate lies will be disappointed. The Khariji then criticized Ali's attire, saying, if only you wore better garment than this. Ali replied, this garment is the farthest from arrogance, and it is more fitting for Muslims to follow my example. And again, this is narrated in Al-Mustadrak, in the same chapter as the previous hadith, it's the hadith right after. Abdul Razak and Ibn Abi Shayba both report with authentic chains, reliable chains to Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, that he once said on the pulpit, what prevents the most wretched person of the community from coming and filling me, from coming and killing me? Oh Allah, I have grown tired of them and they have grown tired of me. So grant me ease from them and grant them ease from me. Abdul Razak's report has the addition, what prevents the most wretched of them from dying this, i.e. his beard, with this, meaning the blood from his head. And then he held his blessed beard. And this report, as you said, is narrated by both Abdul Razak as well as Ibn Abi Shayba in his Musannaf, as well as Ibn Sa'ad in his Kitab al-Tabaqat. Ibn Abi Shayba and al-Baladhuri record with, with good chains, with Sahih chains to Ubaidullah ibn Abi Rafi, who is the son of, of Abu Rafi, the companion of the Prophet wasallam, who says, I saw Ali when the people crowded around him until they hurt his foot. He then said, O oh Allah, I have become weary of them, and they have become weary of me. So relieve me of them, and relieve them of me. And this report is, is, it's honestly quite painful. It's a very painful report because it shows you just how fed up Amir al-Mu'mineen was with these people, with these people who called him Imam, who called him Khalifa, but they would not obey him. These people who had allowed Muawiyah and the Bugat to terrorize and plunder the Islamic world, and eventually they would take over it, and they would dis almost destroy it from its very foundations turning it into a worldly kingdom. You see, Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen said, after a, a lifetime of struggling fi sabilillah, we see he had finally reached that point where he was begging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's like, Ya Allah, I know my death is coming and these people, they've run out of patience for me and I've grown sick of them. Abu al-Faraj al-Isfahani, Ibn Sa'ad and al-Baladhuri all report with chains going back to Abu Tufail, radhwanallahi ta'ala alayhi, who says that Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam gathered the people for the Pledge of Allegiance. And so, Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim al-Muradi alayhi la'anullah came, and Ali refused to accept his Pledge of Allegiance twice or three times. Then he let him make his Pledge of Allegiance, and when he did so, Ali said to him, what prevents the most wretched person of the community from doing his wicked deed now? For I swear by him in whose hand is my life, you will color this with blood from this. And he put his hand on his beard and his head. When Ibn Muljim withdrew and left him, he alayhi salam recited the following. Stiffen your breast for death. Indeed, death will meet you. Do not show grief at death when it arrives in your valley. And so this, this report besides, obviously, as we said, it shows that Imam Ali knew of his impending martyrdom. He knew that, that eventually he would be martyred and he knew that this man, Ibn Muljim alayhi la'anullah, would be the man to, to do it. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, this, this hadith demonstrates something else for us and we'll go over it in a second. They also narrated, and this is again the, the same sources as well as Musannaf Abdul Razak Sanani, the, they narrate that when Ali alayhi salam was giving out the stipends to the Muslims, he was giving out the ata from the Baytul Mal, and he saw Ibn Muljim approach, and then he gave him his stipend, and then he recited the poem, I want his friendship, and he wants my death. The one who makes excuses to you is one of your bosom friends from the tribe of Murad. And this poem that Amir al-Mu'mineen recited is a famous poem from, by a Muradi. It's by a man from Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim's uh, tribe. And this is something you see Amir al-Mu'mineen doing often. Amir al-Mu'mineen knew poetry very well. And he was, we would say that he was a man of literature, a man of words. And so we see that his expertise in the Arabic language combined with his phenomenal understanding and memorization of the Quran 
allowed him to be extremely eloquent in speech. And hence why anyone who, who reads his words will be left in amazement. And so Amir al-Mu'mineen, even when he's talking about his death, even when he comes face to face with the man who he knows is his killer, Amir al-Mu'mineen does not get scared. Amir al-Mu'mineen does not freak out. What does Ali do? He calmly recites a poem. Ali ibn al-Athir reported with his chain of transmission to Uthman ibn al-Mughira, who said when the month of Ramadan when the blessed month of Shahar Ramadan, may Allah a'adahu Allah alayna wa alaykum. When the blessed month of Ramadan began, Ali used to break his fast one night with Al-Hasan, another night with Al-Husayn, and another night with Abdullah ibn Jafar. He would not eat more than three morsels, and he would say, The command of Allah may come at any moment, and I want to be in a state of ritual purity. It is, it is either tonight or in two nights. It is also reported by, uh, from Al-Hasan ibn Kathir from his father who said Ali went out for the Fajr prayer and a group of geese confronted him. These are, in Arabic these are called Iwaz and these many times in the maqtal of Abu Al-Hasan salam Allah alayhi of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam you will hear the khutaba mention this this tragic moment where when Amir al-Mu'mineen goes out for salat a group of geese comes out and they start hooting in his face as though trying to yell at him don't go out stay a bit longer and so Hassan bin Kathir, his father, says, we began to drive them away from him, but he said, leave them, for they are those who wail for my death. And he went out, and the rest of the story we all know. Ali ibn al-Athir comments, and Ali ibn al-Athir is not a Shi'i scholar at all. We're talking about a man who traveled with the army of Salahuddin al-Ayyubi. He commented, this indicates that he knew the year, month, and night in which he would be killed, and Allah knows best. Isn't it? Even in his death, Amir al-Mu'mineen dedicated his life to Islam. He dedicated his life to the service of Allah and his messenger. And even his death proves Islam. Even his death fulfills a prophecy of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is something that even the mukhalifin who attack us for believing that our imams, that Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu alayhi wa was given knowledge of the unseen, even they can see this. Ali knew exactly when he would be killed. He knew exactly when he would be martyred. Before we continue with what happens next to, to Amir al-Mu'mineen salam Allah alayhi, we must discuss who was Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim alayhi la'anullah. Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim, when you see him, for example, in movies, TV shows, when he is portrayed, he's usually portrayed as a very ugly, evil man. And when we look at the historical facts regarding Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim, we see something very interesting. We see a man whose history would indicate that he would have been a man well respected and well revered in the Muslim society. So, who was Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim? Al Kalbi, famous genealogist, recorded his lineage as follows. He says he is Abdul Rahman ibn Amr ibn Muljim ibn Makshuh from the tribe of Nufur ibn Kalada from Himyar. Kalada had shed blood among his people from Himyar. So he came to Murad and said, I have come to you seeking refuge from my camel and from the people of the earth. So he was called Tajub. And this is from the, the famous tribe or the lineage Tajubi. This is where it comes from. It comes from this ancestor of Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim. Narration of Al Kalbi is recorded in Ansab al Ashraf of Al Baladri. Ibn Sa'ad recorded that Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim was a dark skinned man with a handsome face and curly hair that was slicked down over his ears. And on his forehead, there were marks of prostration. So Abdul Rahman the Muljim, you know, if, if you looked at him, you would have said, Allah, look at how handsome and pious this man is. And look at the mark of sujood. And this is something that we see Amir al-Mu'mineen, salam alayhi, as well as our other imams have always pointed out. Is that there are people out there who want you to see surface level. Oh, we are correct because we are the majority. Oh, if this is correct, then why this? If this is correct, then why didn't the Prophet do this? Sometimes it's not about what's on the surface. Sometimes you have to take a closer look. And when th with this evil man, the fact of the matter is when we peel back the layers, we see essentially a monster. A Dhabi recorded the following regarding Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim. He says, Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim al-Muradi, the killer of Ali, was a Kharijite and an extremist. Ibn Yunus mentioned him in the history of Egypt, saying, He participated in the conquest of Egypt and settled in it with the nobility. He was one of the Banu Tadul and their representative in Egypt. He read the Qur'an and he studied jurisprudence, i.e. fiqh. 
he was tutored by Mu'adh ibn Jabal. Okay? Mu'adh ibn Jabal is a, a famous Sahabi. He's one of the big allies of, of Abu Bakr, one of his big allies and military commanders. And he was known for his devo devotion. It is said he was the one who sent Sabigh al-Tamimi to Umar to ask him about what a foreigner had asked him regarding the Qur'an. Those of you who, who know the story of Sabigh ibn Asal, is a story of a man who had some questions about the Qur'an, and he was either in Egypt or in Basra. And so when he came to Egypt, he asked his questions. None of the great, knowledgeable Sahaba could answer them. So they sent him to Umar. And Umar proceeded to torture the man. And after he let him go, he instructed the Muslim community to shun him. And Allah, it hurts even more when you consider the difference between that and between the man who would say, ask me anything about the Qur'an, but such is the dunya. It is also said that Omar wrote to Amr ibn al-As, and this is where things become, we, we would say shocking, but it's not really shocking the more you know about these people. Omar wrote to Amr ibn al-As asking him to expand Ibn Muljim's residence near the mosque, that, they may, that he may teach people the Qur'an and jurisprudence. His residence was expanded, and it was located next to the residence of Abdul Rahman ibn Udais al-Balawi, one of those who supported the assassination of Uthman. Later, Ibn Muljim joined Ali's party in Kufa and accompanied him to the Battle of Safin. He then became one of the Khawarij leading to his assassination of Ali. And this report is, uh, word for word, we quoted at Dhahabi in his Tariq al-Islam. And it's also, I think parts of it are quoted by Ibn Hajj al-Asqalani in his book Al-Islaba, Hitamiz al-Sahara. So what do we see here? We see a man who outwardly was very pious. He was a Quran reciter and he was, you know, very religious. And even the great Omar was a big fan of his exploits. And he said to Amr ibn As, you know, expand this man's house, expand his home so that people may come to him and learn the Quran and learn fiqh from him. And eventually he became, for a while, he was a partisan of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He was one of the Shia of Ali ibn Abi Talib, salam alayhi. And then later, he became one of the Khawarij following the Tahkim at Safin. Now that we have background knowledge, we know about Ali who knew of his assassination and we know who this man was who was going to carry it out. Now we will explain the events as they occurred according to the most reliable sources available to us. A group of Khawarij, and this account is, is transmitted in many sources and I will go over them with you in a second. A group of the Khawarij gathered in Mecca, Mecca al-Mubarakah. And they mention the leaders of the people and blame them for their actions. They mention the people of Nahrawan and they asked Allah's mercy on them. Say, our brothers at Nahrawan, the way Ali slaughtered them. You know, and then this is something you still see that among certain sects, particularly the one in, in Oman, um, the Ibadis, they see that they have this sort of martyr image built around the people of Nahrawan. That these people were on haqq and that Ali was the oppressor when he fought them and he completely annihilated, almost completely annihilated them. So they said to each other, they were, still, they were still licking at their wounds, they were still angry at what happened at Nahrawan. They said, if only we devoted ourselves to Allah and we went to the leaders, the Imams of error, and sought a moment when they were inattentive and then rid the country and the men of them for the sake of Allah and also avenged our brothers, the martyrs of Nahrawan. And they made a compact to do that after the pilgrimage. The Rahman ibn Muljim said, I will take care of killing Ali. Al-Buraq ibn Abdullah al-Tamimi said, I will take care of killing Muawiyah. Amr ibn Bakr al-Tamimi said, I will take care of killing Amr ibn al-As. So they made their compact to do so and bound themselves to its fulfillment. They agreed to carry it out on the night of the 19th of the month of Ramadan. On that night, on, uh, and upon that agreement, they separated. Ibn Muljim la'inahullah set out and he was numbered among Kinda until he came to Kufa. There he met his colleagues, but he kept his task secret from them out of fear that something of it might spread around. The situation was like this when one day he visited one of his colleagues from Taymar Rabab. At this man's house, he met by chance Qatam, the daughter of Akhtar uh, of Taym. Before I continue, there are some people who have posited. This is something that you see some scholars have, have done. Some scholars have provided an alternative narrative for the martyrdom of Amir al They say that this story of Qatam and Ibn Muljim and this whole plot is fake. It's not real. That the, the man really behind the martyrdom of Amir al-Mu'mineen was Muawiyah. And that this story was, was a later concoction. However, this story and the, in, the involvement of Qatam is not only shown by the historical sources, it's also shown by the Hadith sources. Particularly in Al-Mustadrak al-Sahihain, where there is a poem by Al-Farazdaq, 
Al-Farazdaq was a poet who, who was alive during this time, and he mentions these events, and he mentions Qatam's involvement. And so hence this idea that it was somehow a conspiracy theory, and that it was Muawiyah, and that this entire narrative is made up. From my research, I have not really seen a reason to believe that. In any case, when he saw Qatam, you know, Qatam, her backstory is that Amir al-Mu'mineen had killed her father and her brother at Nahrawan, and she was a very beautiful woman. So when Ibn Muljim saw her, he fell in love with her, and his admiration for her became very intense. He asked to marry her and become engaged to her. Then she said to him, what dowry do you suggest for me? So he said to her, whatever you want. And so she said, my dowry that I request of you is 3,000 dirhams, a young serving boy, a servant, and the murder of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He said to her, you can have all that you've asked for. But as for the murder of Ali, how am I supposed to do that? And so she said to him, look for a time when he is careless. And if you kill him, it will, I will cure myself of my obsession against him. I'll finally have my desire, my thirst for vengeance, vengeance will be satiated. And life with me will be a pleasure for you. And if you are killed, Allah has nothing in this world which is better for you than such a death. The only thing which has brought me to this town, he said, was that I was a fugitive from it and I could find no protection with its inhabitants. My intention was to kill Ali ibn Abi Talib, which you have asked me for. So you will have what you have asked for. So she said to him, I've been looking for someone to help you and to strengthen you in that undertaking. And so she went to Warjan ibn al uh, Wardan ibn al Mujalid, who is another man from Tamar Rabab, who was from her tribe. She gave him the information and asked for help for Ibn Muljim. He undertook to share responsibility for that for her. Then Ibn Muljim went out and came to a man from Ashja called Shabib ibn Bajra and said to him, Shabib, would you like nobility in this world and in the next life? I want you to really pay attention to this next part. I want you to listen to the words these two shayateen are going to exchange. So Ibn Muljim is telling Shabib, he says, would you like honor in this world and in the hereafter? So he said, how? So he said, will you help me kill Ali ibn Abi Talib? So Shabib was one of those people who held the views of the Khawarij. So he said to Ibn Muljim, may a wailing woman wail for you at your death, O Ibn Muljim. For you have come to something which is horrific. How will you be able to do it? He said, we will lie and wait for him in the great mosque. Then when he comes at the dawn prayer, we will attack him. If we kill him, we will satisfy ourselves and attain our vengeance. He insisted until he agreed and went with him into the great mosque to Qatam, while she was performing the rite of i'tikaf. I'tikaf, this is something that women used to do back then. You don't really see it anymore. I'tikaf is where a woman will go to the, t to the masjid or, uh, you know, to the mosque. And, you know, mosques are, were very big back then. It's not like today where you have a mosque on every corner in some parts of the Muslim world. So they would go to this large mosque. And remember, Masjid al-Kufa was a massive masjid. And so what they would do is they would set up a tent and they would basically go into that tent and they would just stay there worshiping and reading Quran for a very long time. So they came to her that night. And they said to her, we have reached an agreement on killing this man. She said, when you want to do that, come to me in this place. Then they left her and waited for several days. They came to her finally on the night of Wednesday, the 19th of the month of Ramadan, in the year 40 after Hijrah. She ordered some silk, which she tied around their, their chests. They put on their swords and they went out and sat opposite the door, which Amir al-Mu'mineen would usually come through to the prayer. However, before that, they had told Al-Ash'ath ibn Qais, who is a figure many of you may have heard of, the father of Ja'da and the father of the two men who, who fought against Abu Abdullah al Hussein, who is one of the, the worst hypocrites among these, these so-called revered Sahaba that the Mukhalifin have. He's the man who narrates the hadith of Omar where he was a guest at his house and, and he begins beating his wife. And he is also infamous for the fact that during the Battle of Safin, he was one of Ali's commanders and he essentially paralyzed Ali's army when, the, when they saw the Qur'ans being lifted onto spears. Al-Ash'ath ibn Qais's role is recorded in both Shi'i and Sunni sources. The fact that this Sahabi had a role and he aided the assassins of Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu is recorded in Maqatil al-Talibiyin by Abu al-Faraj al-Asfahani rahmatullah is also recorded in Ansab al-Ashraf and is also recorded in Usd al ghaba by Ali ibn al-Athir. Al-Ash'ath, he approached them, and they approached him, and they told him that they wanted to kill Ali. Al-Ash'ath agreed with them in what they had agreed upon. And so, Hijr ibn Adi, was also spending the night in the mosque. 
he overheard the following conversation, or he caught the last part of the conversation between Ibn Muljim and Al Ash'ath. Al Ash'ath said to Ibn Muljim, Hurry, hurry to your task, for dawn is about to appear. Hajar perceived the intention of Al Ash'ath and said to him, You are trying to kill him, you are going to kill him, you one eyed man. He left directly to go to Amir al Mu'mineen and to tell him the news and to warn him of what these people were plotting. However, Amir al Mu'mineen missed him on the way and went into the mosque. Ibn Muljim came to him first and struck him. And so Amir al-Mu'mineen, when uh, Hajr, by the time Hajr had arrived, he had arrived just as people began screaming, the commander of the faithful has been killed. Al-Baladhari, recorded from Al-Hasan ibn Buzay' and the Sha'bi, uh, has also narrated this. He says that when Ali was struck, he cried out his now famous words, Fustu wa Rabbul Ka'bah, I am victorious by the Lord of the Ka'bah. Ibn Abdul Bar narrated that Ali said this as did Ali ibn al athir This account of Ali's words when he was struck is very well corroborated. Now before we go any further, this entire story of Ali's death is recorded in many sources. The, the plot and how they agreed and they met with Qatam. It is recorded in Al-Tabari, in his history book. It is recorded in Ansab al-Ashraf by al-Baladhri. It is also reported in Al-Isti'ab by Ibn Abdul Bar, who is the famous historian from Al-Andalus, from the western part of the Islamic world, and is also reported by Ali ibn al-Athir in his book Usd al and is also reported by Abu al-Faraj in his book Maqat al-Talibin. So we see that this account is very, very well corroborated, very accepted by the historians, and the various details of it are corroborated by certain hadiths. And one of the, the best sources for it is that chapter in Al-Mustadrak al sahihain The sources for Ali uh, his famous quote of Fustu wa Rabbul Ka'bah, this is reported in Ansab al Ashraf in two different places, as well as I believe Ali ibn al Athir gives, Ali ibn al Athir as well as Ibn Abdul Bar also transmit this saying of Amir al Mu'mineen, salam alayhi, upon being struck. Here we must stop and we must look at a very important question. Ibn Abdul Bar, famous historian al Isti'ab, he posits something interesting. He says, historians, excuse me, have had a disagreement. There's a disagreement as to whether or not Amir al-Mu'mineen, salam alayhi, was he struck in the doorway? Had they ambushed him in one of the doorways of Masjid al-Kufa? Or had he in fact been struck, you know, during Salat? And so this is a question that, that we are going to try to tackle. We, the reports that we sh have shown you, these, uh, the general long historical reports that I just shared with you, that all, each of them, you know, tells pretty much the same story, all of them say or indicate that he was struck at one of the gates or one of the doors. However, there are a few sources that say that he was in fact struck during prayer. Abdul Razak reports with his famous chain from Ma'mar, from a Zuhri, he narrates that Ali, salam alayhi, was struck during Salat. And this is not in Musanif Abdul Razak, but it is in a less, lesser known book of Abdul Razak, Al Amali fi Athar al Sahaba, or sometimes it's called Amali Abdul Razak. Ahmed ibn Hanbal reported with a Sahih chain to the famous Egyptian jurist, who is also a figure who narrates many historical reports, Al Layth ibn Sa'd. He narrates from Al Layth ibn Sa'd that Ali was struck while in a state of sujood. And this is also corrobor uh, the same report is also transmitted in Tarikh Medina Dimashq by Ibn Asakir. Another report comes from Ibn Abi Dunya, the famous Abbasid era scholar who tutored some of the future Khulafa via two chains. He narrates with two chains that Ali alayhi salam was struck while he was praying. And this is in Kitab Maqtal Amir al Mu'mineen by Ibn Abi Dunya. Shaykh al Saduq, Sharif, he records in his Amali, in one of his Majalis, with a Majhul chain to Ali ibn al Hussein alayhi salam that Ali alayhi salam was struck while praying. These sources, all of them are weak for one reason or another. Be it that they are disconnected, be it that they are, have majahil, be it that they have weak narra uh, narrators. So we are left in a strange situation where we have these historical reports, which also none of them have a good chain. But if you trust the historians, you trust that they've done their research, you say, you know, this is that they've researched this narrative, even if it doesn't have a sahih chain, it's quite good. Versus the narrations from the hadith books, which are also weak. So how do we tarjih these reports? The conclusion that I have reached from my research, and the safest option, of course, is to say Allah knows best, as always, whether he was struck in sujood or whether he was struck while they ambushed him in one of the, one of the doors, one of the gateways. However, Shaykh al-Saduq narrates with a good chain, strong chain, to Imam al-Ridha, 
He says that uh, he narrates this long hadith where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa sallam is giving a khutbah. He's giving a, a khutbah. And during the khutbah, this famous Ramadan khutbah that Rasulullah would deliver every year, Amir al-Mu'mineen asked him some questions. So one of the questions he asked him, he said to him, Ya Rasulullah, what is the best of deeds during this sacred month? And so Rasulullah tells Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says, the best of deeds is that or the noblest of deeds in this month, in the sacred month of Ramadan, is abstaining from what Allah Azza wa Jal has forbidden. And when Rasulullah said this, he began to cry. And Allah, all of us should, at least our hearts should, should soften and our eyes should well with tears when we see that anything makes Rasulullah cry. And so Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu asked him, he said, Ya Rasulullah, why do you cry? And so Rasulullah said to him, O oh Ali, I cry for what will be done to you in this month. Is it, as if I, is it, it is as if I see you while you are praying to your Lord and the worst of those of old and those of later times, as evil as the one who killed the she-camel of Thamud will stand up and deliver such a blow to your head that your beard will be stained with blood. Amir al-Mu'mineen said to him, will my religion remain intact in this situation? And Rasulullah said, your religion is intact. Then Rasulullah added, O oh Ali, Whoever kills you has indeed killed me. Whoever despises you has indeed despised me. Whoever swears at you has indeed sworn at me. This is because you are from me and, ju and, and just like myself. Your spirit is my spirit. Your clay is from my clay. In fact, the blessed, the sublime Allah created you and me and appointed you and me. God chose me for the prophethood and chose you for divine leadership. Whoever denies your divine leadership has in fact denied my prophethood. O oh, Ali, you are my wasi, the father of my grandchildren, the spouse of my daughter, the khalifa over my nation during and after my life. Your orders are just like my orders. Your admonishing is just like my admonishing. I swear by him who has appointed me to the prophethood and established me as the best of people that you are God's proof over his creatures, the one entrusted with his secrets and his successor over his servants. And besides being a very powerful narration, that lists many of the great fala'il of Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu This report indicates that the Prophet said that Ali will be struck while praying. And so this would allow us to do tabjih between these reports. And we would say simply that the other details of the assassination, which the historians reported, are corroborated by hadith. But the detail of him being struck in one of the doors is not corroborated. On the contrary, we have stronger hadiths that indicate that he was struck while praying and we say Allah knows best. Now we arrive to the aftermath, after he was struck. After Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu was struck, Ibn Muljim was apprehended and brought before him. Ali looked at him and said, a life for a life. If I die, kill him as he killed me. If I live, I will consider my judgment on him. By Allah, Ibn Muljim la'inahullah snarled, I have, brought his, uh, I have brought his life for a thousand lives. I have plotted against him for a thousand lives. If he has betrayed me, then may Allah destroy him. And at this point, Ali's daughter, Umm Kulthum, alayha, cried out, Enemy of Allah, you have killed the commander of the faithful. I have only killed your father, he retorted. Enemy of Allah, she cried, I hope that there is no danger for him. And he replies back, I think you are only crying for Ali. Okay, so she is reassuring herself and he's mocking her. And he replied, Indeed, by Allah, I struck him. If, I had been if my strike had been divided among the people of the land, I would have destroyed him. Essentially, what Ibn Muljim is saying here, there are other reports that say this in more detail. He's saying that this sword that I used and the poison that I brought for it, if I had struck everyone in Kufa with it, it would have killed them. No one would be able to survive such a strike. And we say, you know, it's, it's a testament to Amir al-Mu'mineen's strength that he survived for two nights afterwards. Then he was taken away from Ali while the people wanted to tear his flesh with their teeth. And they were crying out, O oh, enemy of Allah, what have you done? You have destroyed the community of Muhammad sallallahu You have killed the best of our people. But he was silent and did not speak. And he was taken to prison. Ibn Abdul Bar records that Abdullah ibn Malik said, The doctors were gathered for Ali alayhi salam on the day that he was wounded. And the most proficient among them in, is, uh, in medicine was Athir ibn Amr al-Sakuni who was also called Athir ibn Amriya. He was the physician of Kisra, who was the, the, Persian, uh, the Persian king, the Shah. And the desert of Athir is named after him. 
So when Amin al-Mu'minin was struck, they brought him the most proficient doctor that was available at that time, who's a man who once served the, the king of Persia. And so Athir took a, the hot lung of a sheep and traced a vein from it, extracted it and inserted it into Ali's wound. He then blew on the vein and pulled it out, only to find that there was whiteness of the brain on it and that the strike had reached the top of his brain. So he said to Amir al-Mu'mineen, he said, O commander of the faithful, make your testament, for you are surely going to die. This report is, is uh, recorded in Al-Isti'ab by Ibn Abd al-Barr. Ibn Asakir narrated that Uqba, when Abi Sahba said, when Ibn Muljim struck Ali, Al-Hasan al-Mujtaba went in to see him weeping. And Ali said to him, as though as a way to console him, to reassure him, he said to him, my son, Memorize from me four and four. And he said, what are they, father? He said, intelligence is the wealthiest of riches. The greatest poverty is folly. The loneliest solitude is conceit. And the noblest of noble qualities is good character. He said, and the other four. He said, beware of keeping the company of a fool. For he wants to benefit you and he, har for he, wants to benefit you, and he harms you. Essentially, a fool, even when he wants to help you, he makes the situation worse. Beware of befriending a liar, for he will make the remote seem near to you and the near seem remote. Beware of befriending a mean person, for he will sit inactively how much you are, how much you are in need of him. And beware of befriending an immoral person, for he will sell you for a trifling sum. And this hadith, subhanAllah, we see that even when he is in, we would describe excruciating pain. When he had, he had taken a blow to the brain, he still had not lost any of his eloquence. He still had not lost any of his wisdom. And he had not lost any of, of anything which made him Amir al-Mu'mineen, salam Allah And we say it is a fadila for him to transmit such a thing. And it is a fadila for Imam al-Mujtaba to receive it from him. And it is a fadila for us to call ourselves his Shia. And to try to live by this advice of Abu al-Hasan, salam Allah even on his deathbed. Furthermore, it is, it is narrated by Ali ibn al-Athir is transmitted from Amr the Murra. He says, when Ali was wounded by the strike, I entered upon him and his head was bandaged. And I said, oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, show me your wound. So he said to me, uncover it, see for yourself. So I said to him, it's just a scratch, it's nothing. And he said, I will be departing from you. And Umm Kulthum heard this and she began crying from behind the veil. And he told her, if you could see what I, could, what I see, you wouldn't have cried. So I said, O oh, commander of the faithful, what do you see? He said, these are the angels and the prophets. And this is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, O oh, Ali, be glad for what will happen to you where you are going is better than the state which you are in. Shaykh al-Mufid reported on the authority of al-Asbah ibn Nabata al-Abdi, who is one of Amir al-Mu'mineen's close disciples. And is a man who, those of you who study hadith, you will know that the Mukhalifin have a certain distaste from, for this man because he was a, a Rafali. And he narrates this. He's the, he narrates this, this event that occurred to him. So he narrates, he says, When Ibn Muljim struck the fatal blow to Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, we passed by him in the morning, myself and Al-Harath al-A'war and Al-Suwayd ibn Ghafla. Al-Harath al-A'war is another prominent companion of Amir al-Mu'mineen who narrated much of his fiqh in Kufa. He says, we went to see him in the morning to see how he was doing. And we stopped at the door and we just heard weeping. So we wept also. So Al-Hasan ibn Ali alayhi salam came to us and said, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam requests you to return to your, to your homes. So they all left except myself. Again, there was intense wailing from inside the house and I wept also. And Al-Hasan alayhi salam came out and said, did I not ask you to leave? I said, by Allah, O son of the messenger of Allah, my heart does not allow me to go and my feet refuse to carry me until I see Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. He said, al he said, then al-Hasan paused and then he entered the house. And soon after he came out, allowing me to enter. As I entered, I saw Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam sitting with support with a yellow headband tied around his head, drained of blood and his face pale. And I could not discern which one was more yellow, his face or the headband. So I fell over him, kissed him, and I kept on crying. And he said, do not cry, O Asbah, for it is my way to paradise. 
So I said to him, may I be your ransom? I know full well that you are proceeding to paradise. I weep because I will terribly miss you, O Amir al-Mu'mineen. May I be your ransom? Please narrate to me a tradition which you heard from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. For I fear that I might never have a chance to hear from you anything after this day. And we know full well, my dear brothers and sisters, that following his martyrdom, the Imam transferred to Imam al Hassan al Mujtaba. It transferred to Aba Abdullah al Hussein, to a Sajjad al Baqir al Sadiq. And it is currently with our master, Sahib al Amr, Ajallah Faraj al Sharif. But Al Asbakh is right. After today, no one will be able to hear the hadith directly from Amir al-Mu'mineen, salam alayhi. So this man, this blessed man, in those final moments, he recognized that. He recognized that this is it. This is goodbye. This is the last chance I will ever have to open Bab Medina to ilm to receive it directly from him. And so Amir al-Mu'mineen, salam alayhi, despite being so close to death, obliges him. And he narrated the following hadith. He said, yes, O Asbaq, once Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called me and said, O Ali, go to my mosque, climb the pulpit, and summon the people to gather before you. Then after praising Allah jalla wa ala and lauding him and invoking abundant blessing upon me, say, O people, I am a messenger from the messenger of Allah to you. And he says, curse from Allah, his honored angels and his prophets, and from me befall he, him who attributes himself to anyone other than his father, or who acts against his masters, or who unjustly usurps the right of his employee, or a person he has hired to work. So I went to his mosque, climbed upon the pulpit, and when the Quraysh and others pre uh, present in the mosque saw me, they drew close to me. I praised Allah and glorified him, invoked abundant blessing upon the Prophet and said, O people, I am the messenger from the messenger of Allah to you. And he says to you, curse from Allah, his honored angels and his prophets, and from me befall him who attributes himself to anyone other than his father, or who acts against his masters, or who unjustly usurps the right of his employee, or a person he has hired for work. He said no one from the people spoke anything, except Umar ibn al-Khattab, who, who said, O Abu al-Hasan, you have indeed conveyed, but you have come up with a statement which is not clear. I said, I will convey your response to the prophet. So I returned, to the mo uh, returned and informed the Prophet, and he said, Go back to, the mo to my mosque, climb my pulpit, praise and glorify Allah, and invoke his blessings upon me, and say, O people, we did not come to you with anything unless we have its explanation. So be it known, I am the Father, and I am the Master, and I am the one employed by Allah for you. And this narration is narrated by al Asbagh ibn Nubata, and uh, is transmitted by Shaykhun al Mufid in his uh, Kitab al-Amali. When death came to Ali alayhi salam, he made his testament and follows. And this is the will of Amir al-Mu'mineen. It is one of the most beautiful and most powerful things narrated on his authority. And it's something that, that I wish to, to share with you. And I've read over it in the past. But this is something, this is one of those things that everyone needs to have in his pocket. This is one of those things that everyone, every one of us should try to memorize at one point. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, his last will and testament reads as follows. He says, in the name of Allah, the merciful, the compassionate. This is the testament of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He testifies that there is no God but Allah alone without partner, and that Muhammad is his servant and his messenger, who he sent with right guidance and the religion of truth to make it triumphant over every other, even though the polytheists abhor it. My prayer and my ritual my life and my death belong to Allah, the Lord of the worlds, who has no partner. Thus I was commanded, and I am one of those who submit. I commend to you, Hassan, and all my offspring and family, the fear of Allah, your Lord. Die only as Muslims and hold fast together to the rope of Allah, not separating. I heard Abu Qasim saying, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the restoration of unity is better than all your prayer and fasting. Look to your relatives and unite them. May God make easy for you the reckoning. Fear God, fear God with regard to the orphans. Fear Allah, fear Allah with regard to the orphans. And neither restrain their entreaties, nor let them be lost while in your care. Fear Allah, fear Allah with regard to those who have a right to your protection and hospitality. The Arabic word is jihanukum, your neighbors. For they are the commendation of your prophet, who never ceased to commend them to us, so that we thought he would include them as heirs. 
Fear Allah, fear Allah with regard to the Quran and do not allow anyone to do more than you in acting in accordance with it. Fear Allah, fear Allah with regard to the prayer for it is the pillar of your religion. Fear Allah, fear Allah with regard to the house of your Lord and do not leave it as long as you live. If it is abandoned, there will never be another com to be compared with it. Fear Allah, fear Allah with regard to jihad fi sabilillah, with your property and your lives. Fear Allah, fear Allah with regard to zakat, for it quenches the anger of Allah. Fear Allah, fear Allah with regard to the protection, the dhimma granted by your Prophet, and do not allow the dhimmi to be oppressed among you. Fear Allah, fear Allah with regard to the companions of your Prophet, for the Messenger of Allah commended them to us. Fear Allah, fear Allah with regard to the poor and the destitute, and give them in share of your li uh, in your li livelihood. Fear Allah, fear Allah with regard to what your right hand possesses. Observe the prayer always. Do not fear Allah before the blame of any man. He is sufficient protector for you against anyone who designs upon you and oppresses you. Speak good to the people as Allah has commanded you and do not abandon the commanding of the good and the forbidding of the evil so that the worst ones among you uh, obtain power. Then you will call but no, one, no answer will be given to you. You must pursue mutual harmony and generosity, avoiding mutual opposition, separation and fragmentation. Help one another in piety and fear of Allah, but not in sin and enmity to him. Fear Allah for his retribution is mighty. May Allah preserve you as members of a family and your prophet as one of you. I entrust you to Allah and I bid you farewell and the mercy of Allah be upon you. Tabari and Ali ibn al-Athir reported from Abdurrahman ibn Habib ibn Abdullah from his father who said when Ali finished his will, he said peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah be upon you. Then he did not speak except to repeat, there is no God but Allah until, uh, until Allah took him. Shaykh ibn al-Kulayni narrated from Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, he said when Amir al-Mu'mineen died, al-Hasan and Hussein and two other men carried his body out until they left Kufa. They continued with Kufa on their right and they moved forward on the path of Jabana until they passed Al Ghari. They then buried him and leveled his grave and they returned home. My dear brothers and sisters, I think all of us tonight, and those of you who will obviously are not listen, who will be listening to this when I'm not with you, I feel that all of us, our hearts now yearn for the land of Najaf al Ashraf. I think all of us yearn for our Amir, for Abu Hassan Salam Allah and our Heartfelt condolences go out to Sahib al-Amr ajallahu faraj al-Sharif for the loss of not only Amir al-Mu'mineen, for the, the loss of his grandfather Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa for the loss of a Sayyid al-Zahra, the loss of al-Hasan wal Hussein, one pious Imam after the other, each one oppressed, each one and their Shia forced to endure a difficult life and a difficult death. And so we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to visit Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen salam Allah alayhi in Najaf. To allow us to live up to the expectations he has of us as his Shia. Not to make us among those who claim to be his Shia, who made things difficult for him, but rather those who obeyed him even when they found his orders to be difficult. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy for us to understand the words of Amir al-Mu'mineen salam Allah to make it easy to memorize his hadith, to memorize his ahkam, to memorize that Qur'an which he loved so much, to memorize his words, to live like Ali and perhaps to die like Ali, should Allah feel that we are fit to do so. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to bring back the month of Ram the sacred month of Ramadan upon us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the honor of Hajj of his sacred house. And we'll end this majlis with salawat upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad and Surah Al-Fatiha.